uh, the actual subject of today's webinar, Leading in Times of Crisis uh, and Solutions from Neuroscience. For those of you that are familiar with my work or you've read my book or you've heard me speak before, you know that our focus is on the brain and the role of emotion in the brain and uh, understanding insights from the neurosciences and applying them in the workplace. The advantage being they work uh, every time. It's, it's remarkable, much better than typical leadership interventions that are just cognitive and tactical and, and tend not to have a lot of staying power. The particular circumstance we're in now regarding engagement for employees <clears throat> is in the middle of a pandemic. And there's two things that this picture depicts and reminds us of. One, it's a pandemic. We're wearing a face mask. We're trying to protect ourselves from imminent danger. Uh, but also, we tend to be alone. We're much more likely to be isolated in this environment than we ever have been before. Even if we're going to work um, in, in a regular bricks and mortar building or office, or, or if we're out in the field with a team, uh, there is just the sense of being more alone and being much more aware of your positioning vis-a-vis -vis everyone else. And this adds um, additional uh, stress um, uh, to the workplace, this notion of stress and isolation it's very, very high right now. It's high for managers. It's high for leaders at all levels. It's, it's high for employees. So a pause here for a second. Early on, for those of you uh, with us today, please go back to your phone, or you can do it on your computer. Go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Enter in the six-digit code you see at the top of this slide. And my question to you is, what has your biggest challenge been with your team over the past few weeks? What has your biggest challenge been with your team over the past few weeks? Uh, first piece of content, staying engaged with the team uh, remotely. Same as always, it's communication related, that's good. There's some extra stressors on communication now because uh, in many cases, uh, we don't have the advantage of being face-to-face -face with folks. But I'd like to get some of our other participants on here uh, entering in some content. What has your biggest challenge been with your team? over the past few weeks. Honesty, um, okay. I think you said honestly. Um, maybe there's something you were gonna continue with. Uh, we all seem to be working more than we did when in the office, but have more distractions at home with the family and kids, yes. Consistent delivery of, of information, uh, connection, just connection itself, staying connected, okay. Seven of you have participated. Uh, that's less than half, so a few more of you, please, please lean in, go on your phone or on your computer and just go to menti.com and enter in this code. Uh, everyone is over the social distancing, exactly. Outside distractions and staying connected. All right, this, this is a good collection. Um, yes, everyone is over the, uh, the social distancing, the physical distancing, and I get it. And, and we're going to talk about one of the reasons why a lot of us are over it. Most of us are over it. Um, and, and it is essentially because we're hardwired uh, to be in groups and to connect with others. It just, the, the brain codes isolation as threat. It just, it's just hardwired in the brain. So, of course, it feels more disconcerting, and we're going to go into that in some detail. So a couple of things about the environment right now with the pandemic. It has a particular impact on the two newest generations in the workplace. Gen Z, anyone who's 23 or younger, uh, bad luck for them to be entering the workforce during a pandemic. It's a little bit like the millennials who many of them entered the workforce during a recession. It just feels harder. It's not what you expected. It's not what they expected. Millennials have also been particularly hard hit in this pandemic because they're less likely as an age group to own property, to own their own home, uh, even less so than their parents, uh, more likely to be gig, so-called gig economy workers. And so uh, often they were the first to be released and, and without work. And it's just been particularly rugged on those two groups, least able to uh, maintain some resiliency uh, in the middle of this. In terms of engagement, we're, we're going, so at E3 Solutions, <coughs> we focus on how to get employees engaged when they're at work. And, and traditionally, this has been at work where they all come together uh, in bricks and mortar. And in some cases, that is still the case, but it feels different for folks. Some don't want to come in. They resent coming in. But primarily right now, we're focused on getting people engaged when they're working alone, when they're by themselves. Again, we're back to isolation and feeling separated. And that makes everything we do harder. So we want to keep engagement up. 
So how do we define employee engagement? Because there, there, there are a bunch of definitions out there, but this is our very simple definition. It's an employee's willingness to freely give their discretionary effort to their employer. Now, what do we mean by that? So every employee knows what level of effort they have to bring when they get to work so that they don't get pulled aside and say, hey, what's the matter? What's going on with you today? So they all know this minimum level of work that they have to, to produce in order to get through the day unhassled. But every single one of your employees has an additional level of effort that represents what they're fully capable of doing as a human being. And the difference between what someone is capable of doing and what they typically do when they get to work is what we call discretionary effort. And the fact is, every employee goes to work every day, even if it's at their kitchen table, with discretionary effort that they could volunteer to you if they wanted to. There is no way to force discretionary effort out of someone. You can't do it, can't be done. It has to be volunteered. Now, some of you might be trying to bribe it from them, which is what pay for performance is. It's a bribe system. Um, and the science on bribing homo sapiens is really ugly, not the subject of this um, webinar. But just know if the only tool you have to uh, increase the engagement of your employees is some compensation scheme, uh, that you'll never get as much from them as you could if you do some of the things we talk about today. Okay, so what does it look like when you measure engagement? So at E3 Solutions, my company, we have a proprietary survey, 28 questions, it's relatively brief, and every employee in the, uh, in the company, in the organization, answers these 28 questions. And when they're done, we can put them into four categories of engagement. So this is what it looks like. It, it looks like a, a bell curve, a histogram. What, <clears throat> what a bell curve means is that most of the people you measured are somewhere in the middle. But then you have outliers at either side. So let's look on the left side, the left outliers, the actively disengaged. This is a group of employees who are, <coughs> as the label states, actively disengaged. They're not giving you any discretionary effort ever. They're just doing the bare minimum, usually below the bare minimum. And they represent anywhere from five to 15% of employees um, inside a typical organization when, they first, when that organization first starts measuring. The largest group in most companies are what we call the somewhat disengaged. These are the employees, they're giving you some discretionary effort, maybe an hour or two a day, uh, maybe a day, a week. Uh, so it's there, they have it, and occasionally they give it, but for the most part, not. Not consistently and not predictably. This is perhaps one of the most important groups in an organization, a team, a group, a department, because they're the most likely to be able to shift to the right and really change outcomes inside the organization. When we cross that center line in this image, you get to the, to the employees who are regularly giving you discretionary effort, uh, the engaged, typically 20 to 25% of our employees, one, one out of five, one out of four, are in this category. And they're great. They are the backbone of every high performance culture um, because there's, that's where the majority of folks sit. Now, the actively engaged on the far right, also outliers, meaning that they, there aren't a lot of them. They're, they're what um, statisticians would call um, deviants, um, but in this case, positive deviants, that is deviant from the norm. Um, five to 15% of the total population typically um, in the first year of company measures. These, these employees are remarkable. They create a lot of positive uh, uh, energy. Uh, they're great mentors. Uh, they become role models. They set the standard typically for the best behavior in an organization. We, we use a shorthand just internally. We, we refer to the actively engaged as your A players, the engaged as your B players, the somewhat disengaged C players, and the actively disengaged as your D players. There are characteristics of their behavior at work in each of these categories. I'd like to talk about just one, and that is uh, productivity. The actively disengaged are typically giving you a, uh, a half day's work for a full day's pay, uh, for a productivity multiplier of 0.5. The somewhat disengaged, slightly more productive, a productivity multiplier of 0.66, meaning that you're paying them for eight hours of work, they're giving you five and a quarter hours. The actively disengaged out of eight hours of pay, they're giving you four hours of real work. We cross the line into the engaged, that old saying, a decent day's work for a decent day's pay. They're one for one. 
paying them for eight hours, they're giving you eight hours. And then over in the far right, the actively engaged, uh, they're remarkable. They're giving you one and a half days work for one day's pay for a productivity multiplier of 1.5. And the reason it's so important to measure is because when you measure and you find out how many employees you have in each of these categories, you can start to determine the cost of disengagement just in terms of productivity. That is, you're, you, you pay every employee 100% of their salary every payday, but are they giving you 100% of what they should? And the answer is no. And the, but they get paid the same regardless. And so this is one of the dangers inside an organization. The A player is typically paid the same as the D player, and they know that. And when they're treated the same as the C and the D, is very corrosive to, to the behavior of A's and B's. So you want to know, how many people do I have on the left? Where are they? And, uh, and that's something that measuring allows you to do. We'll talk a little bit more about um, measuring here in, in just a little bit. Um, so what are these drivers of engagement? What determines how people behave and, and where they land in each of these categories? And we divide those drivers of engagement into two camps, if you will. So over on the left, there are some cognitive things that do have a big impact on engagement. Things like resources and training, that, that falls into this category of capability. Do they have what they need to be successful, the right tools, the right training? Also, do they have the right focus? Do they know what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it? So those are very important drivers of engagement that employees need. Our focus at E3 Solutions is on the right side of this slide, and it's more on the emotional drivers of engagement because those are the ones that are the most important. Things like what are the impacts of relationships inside a workplace, well-being, safety and trust, recognition and validation, and then lastly, inspiration and motivation. Uh, these are the things that are not well understood at a science-based level, that is at a brain-based level, typically. And most, what I mean by that is in leadership literature, just barely touches on what we know in the sciences. So my background uh, is in the sciences. I was a technical consultant to the uh, Technology, Space, and Science Committee in the House of Representatives. And then I was a science advisor to the Secretary of the US Department of Health and Human Services. And when I founded E3 Solutions 12 years ago, my goal was to bring more science into HR and leadership because there's very little science there right now. More than a thousand books uh, in print today on leadership, very few of them are actually based on science, which means that what those authors write about may or may not unfold the same for you, probably will not. So they're good case studies, good vignettes, good autobiographies, but they are not good sources of creating a, a roadmap for what you could do inside your organization to keep engagement up, especially in the middle of a pandemic. So let's dive in a little bit, get a little bit more information about the brain. The brain is a really busy place. More than 1.3 trillion transactions a second are taking place. And here's an artist's depiction of what those connections look like. This would be a depiction of a, what's called a synaptic connection. And these connections occur both electrically and chemically, but 1.3 trillion of them going on every second in the brain. The, so it's a really incredibly busy place. But at the end of the day, what, what seems to be in charge? What, what do we now know uh, actually is in charge? It's not just a bunch of transactions taking place randomly. There's actually an agenda in the brain. What, uh, it's, a, it's a direction, if you will, that it's moving in. And it all focuses around the role of emotion. That is when you get down to the cellular level in the brain, what part of the brain has what's called control precedence is in charge. It is the role of emotion. Now here's the key thing for us as leaders that we need to understand. The, the brain has a specific agenda that it's pursuing, and every human being in the world wakes up with the same identical agenda. And it's important for us as leaders to understand what that is, because if we can help the brain find it at work, that's when engagement goes up. So I want to show you where this agenda started and how it started. So you need to come with me to East Africa, to the open uh, savannas of, of, the, of the Serengeti or the Maasai Mara um, just endless, endless, endless acres of grasslands. One of the most prolific mammals uh, here on these grasslands is, is an animal that's not very attractive, uh, the wildebeest. Um, but if you're there in migration system you, and a season, you'll see tens of thousands of these mammals marching across uh, the Serengeti, eating as they go in their migration patterns. Very, very prolific source of protein for other carnivores. Now here's a quick question for you. And this is why 
uh, we're, we're taking a look at these not so attractive animals. If you're a wildebeest migrating in East Africa, are you gonna be safest if you are by yourself searching out a greener patch of grass or a different watering hole? Or are you gonna be safer if you're inside the herd? Where will you be safer? Well, clearly inside the herd. This was, if, if you were in the group, in the herd, your chances of survival go way, way up, to, even today, uh, astronomically go up than if you're out there alone. But it wasn't just true for wildebeest. It was also true for Homo sapiens. And has been ever since, when, whenever you think we began as a species, doesn't matter to me, but from that point forward, the, the, the ability to be in a group was tantamount to safety and success. All you had to do is outrun one person and you lived another day. Now, this reality of existence and what was, for the majority of our history, a very brutal, uh, unforgiving uh, environment, it was so important to us as a species that neuroscientists now say every fold of our cerebral matter is dedicated to being in a group. And that's this primary fundamental agenda of the brain is to get in and to be a part of something because that's where your chances of success are the highest. Stated most succinctly by a brilliant neuroscientist at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, uh, Dr. James Cohn, he said the dominant ecology for human beings is other human beings. We are at our core herd animals, hardwired to be in a group. Now, we don't grow up in tight knit tribes anymore. Okay, Packers fans, that's an anomaly. Uh, but, but for most of us, where do we spend most of our time when we're awake with other adults? Well, it's at work. So in a very real sense, work is the new tribe for the 21st century Homo sapien. We are hardwired to go there, to be with others, to be in a group, and all the benefits that accrue from that. This is one of the challenges of the pandemic that we're in, is we have now been exploded away. Uh, many employees are now working alone in isolation. Now, I know they're at home with their families, but that still is, in, in many cases, feels quite alone and quite isolated, especially if, if they're being pressed for time to do other things like childcare or these other things, just increases, intensifies the sense, sense of isolation. So two key parts of the brain for us to understand. Um, the prefrontal cortex, which you see here, right the part of your brain right behind your skull plate, um, this is where you do your thinking and analysis, problem solving. And then there's the limbic system in the midbrain, includes organs like the amygdala, the hypothalamus, uh, the hippocampus. But the limbic system is the epicenter of fight, flight, or freeze. It's where we process emotion. The prefrontal cortex, intellect, problem solving. What's the challenge for us? The prefrontal cortex, we are only aware of about 2% of what our brain is doing. 98% of our brain's activity is below our consciousness. The part of the brain that's in charge turns out to be the limbic system. Uh, and that's, that's the key to understanding discretionary effort, especially people's desire to volunteer it to us. That's determined primarily in the limbic system. And so for centuries, we've been talking to uh, employees' uh, prefrontal cortex what I want, what we try to do at E3 Solutions is help managers and leaders understand how to talk to the limbic system as directly as possible because that determines how people behave during the day. You won't find that in, uh, in the leadership genre, um, but that's, that's the basis of which the brain, on which the brain operates. Now, I did ask Dr. Cohn, uh, what do you tell your students in Neuroscience 101 about how do you describe the limbic system to them? in a way that makes it easy for them to understand in its role in the brain. And he jokes, he says, well, you need to understand, it's not very bright, but it's hypervigilant for threat. It is the epicenter of fight, flight, or freeze. It, it is, it is hypervigilant for threat, but it's not very bright. It doesn't have an IQ. And he said, what does that remind you of? And I did not get it, and he finally had to tell me. But they joke about it being like a squirrel. Not very smart, but hypervigilant for threat. Twig drops that squirrel up the tree. So I wanna get you all in touch with your inner squirrel. That may sound a little silly, but the squirrel has control precedence and it's looking for something every minute of every day, even while you're asleep. Obviously it's focused on your survival, but let's break it down into two parts that managers can understand. We have a boot camp for managers and now we have a, an online uh, a workshop uh, for managers and, and we'll be uh, announcing some dates for the next one done virtually now. But we show managers this diagram. We see that the, the limbic system is focused on safety and connection. 
Now, the key part here is we now know the limbic system will never feel safe if it's alone, if it's in isolation. So understanding this role of connection in the world, in the, in the, in the science world, the therapy world, it would be referred to as a safe and secure connection or a safe and secure attachment figure, someone that we can connect with, load share with. And when we have those kinds of people in our lives, we thrive. Uh, when we don't, we struggle. So what, is the, what does the limbic system want? Two things, key things. What's next and how am I doing? What's next, how am I doing? The what's next is very simple, very direct. For managers, the most important thing for them to, to do is to be consistent and predictable. And this has taken a hit in the pandemic. Uh, managers have not been as consistent and predictable. It is harder to do when folks typically are remote or even if they're still coming in in this kind of environment, but it's been rugged. But the two most important things for the limbic system to determine a felt sense of safety is consistency and predictability. Now, what's this other question over here on the right? How am I doing? This is just all about, uh, am I in the group? Do they see me? Do they know me? Do they value me? Am I likely to stay or are they about to kick me out? Um, what are the key things managers can do here? Validation and recognition as frequently as possible. Feedback and support, really important. Letting them know what success looks like, letting them know if they're valued. So <clears throat> when you look at this diagram, you also realize you can connect the dots. So we want managers to consistently provide validation and recognition, be predictable in the way they provide feedback and support, be clear around what success looks like, and to be inclusive. That is to include people in meetings and decisions, because when you include them, you're sending the signal that they are valued. And just really important steps that managers uh, can take. Now, the last thing in this section, just having talked about emotion here, I just want to give you a definition of emotion. And this uh, should be helpful to you in, in re, I guess, reframing the way you think of emotion. We typically think of it as irrational, mercurial, it's all over the place. Uh, but emotion has a very specific role in the brain. It is our internal GPS, guiding our actions, behaviors, and thoughts toward a destination the brain has been seeking every day since birth. The guidance is prolific, subconscious, and driven by the hardwired need for connection, validation, and predictability. And we can't forget that emotion has control precedence in our brain. Absolutely uh, uh, in, in critically important. And in business, quite frankly, in many ways, has tried to keep emotion out of work. We've told people to leave that stuff at home. You're at work now. The, the key thing for us to understand as leaders is the limbic system isn't smart enough to know if it's at work or at home. It really it, it can't distinguish between the two. It just knows whether or not it feels safe in the moment. So if we don't feel safe at work, that goes home. If we don't feel safe at home, that comes to work. Uh, how do we increase a felt sense of safety at work? Predictability and consistency. And then some other things specifically I'll be talking about in the context of COVID-19. Um, so I'm going to move uh, in interest of time and I'll take questions at the end. I don't see anything in the chat room right now, so I'm going to keep moving. Um, oh, there is a Q&A icon here. Let me just see what we have up here. Will the slides I'm seeing on the phone be made available? Yes, we will uh, include these Mentimeter slides and all of these slides, uh, if you're watching this on your phone, uh, will be available uh, on this webinar. It is being recorded, so it would be uh, available to you after the case. And we'll send an email um, about how to get access, okay? So I want to come back to measuring for a second. Why do we want to measure engagement? Um, and I'm going to um, show you a way to, to measure it um, at, at very, very low cost to you, just, just to make sure. We, we've, we've created a product that will allow you to measure engagement in your organization um, really inexpensively because getting this data is really essential. It gives us a roadmap for growth on how we can grow. What do we need to do to grow? It brings science and data into this conversation about our culture. And as I'm sure all of you have heard, culture trumps strategy every day of the week. Um, serious long-term focus on engagement, really clear signal about that when we measure regularly. Uh, and then it identifies new leadership skills that our managers need. And that's really, really important. Um, as I showed you before, what does it look like when you measure engagement? It can be categorized. You'll know how many employees you have in each of these categories. But when we look over here on the left, these actively disengaged employees, what's, why do we worry about them? Let's, maybe we could just carry them for a while. Maybe they don't matter. Or 
Maybe they do matter. Maybe they matter a lot. So in a, in a, in a uh, workshop I did uh, in a large group, there, I think there's probably at least 200 uh, managers in the room at this conference. And I asked them, what does disengagement look like inside your organization? And I was using Mentimeter, so I was able to crowdsource a big screen. And so you can see in this organization, uh, negativity uh, got, got the most votes, uh, followed up with gossip and apathy. There were multiple votes for complaining. But in this constellation around this are some other really important um, um, insights into what disengagement is doing to us. Ambivalence, defensiveness, uh, only focuses on the negative, challenges authority, disruptive, unhappy, lazy, absent, distracted, drama, blaming, minimal effort, lack of humor, uh, indifference, withdrawn, confused, conflict, sloppy, disgruntled, it just goes on and on and on. And my question to you is, do these kinds of behaviors have a material impact on your organization? And of course they do. Uh, and th this is one of the big drivers of disengagement inside organizations is when these deep layers on the left side of the bell curve are left untouched. So we need to know how many of them we have and hopefully where are they so that we can go in and start to create some change. Now, having said that, I'm not just out here to blame the D players because when we measure engagement, we do it by manager. And what you discover in an organization is that uh, often the, the most disengaged employees often aggregate under specific managers. So, the, and here's the issue for you. Let's, let's say you measure engagement and you have 100 employees and you measure engagement and you discover you have 14 that are D players actively disengaged. You might say, okay, we gotta get rid of those folks right now because this Reem guy said they're really disruptive. Well, I don't want you to do that and here's why. So look closely at the numbers and, and if you're using our full tool where we do it by work group, um, you discover that of those 13 actively disengaged, 10 of them report to four managers. Now, the issue for you is if you fire those 10 D players, what will you have in a year when you measure again? Or in six months when you measure again? You'll probably have 10 more. Why is that? It's not, it's not the employees. It's the manager. And it turns out that about 70% of the variance of how engaged an employee is, is directly attributable to their immediate manager or supervisor. 70% of the variance is determined by that relationship between manager and employee. And that's what we need to find. That's what we need to measure and find out where is it working? Where are those relationships solid and working well? People are engaged, productive, profitable, providing good customer service with good high quality. And what are the work groups where that is struggling? And the goal isn't to rush in and to fire the manager, but to find the managers that are struggling, often technically brilliant in their field. They've had lots of experience, but as leaders of other adults, <clears throat> They're not doing so well, and that's the norm uh, in organizations across the U.S. today. I want to show you what the, what the journey looks like, and then we'll get into the specifics on, uh, on COVID-19. This is our, our global data showing um, the levels of engagement in all four of those categories over the first five years of the company's journey. So you can see in the top bar in the first year, the average company's level of engagement was 45%. Fifty-five percent of employees were disengaged, and you can see the proportion of the A's in the dark green, the B's in the green, C's in the red, D's in the dark red. And you see something interesting happens year over year over year. Engagement goes up, and not only are the number does the number of engaged employees go from forty-five percent of employees to sixty-seven percent over two thirds in year five, but the proportion of the engaged that are A players is going way up. And that's where the, some of the biggest productivity gains come from that helps uh, improve the bottom line in organizations. But not only are they more productive, but the workplace just feels better. People are much more likely to enjoy going to work and to like work when they get there. And that's what we consider one of the key responsibilities for managers to be. The question you can ask yourself is, do my managers at every level, supervisor, team leads, do they have the ability to create the conditions where employees look forward to coming to work. And that's essential for having a high performance culture. You will never have a high performance uh, culture if, if employees can't stand and dread going to work and they're only doing it to get a paycheck. It's the worst position to be in as an organization. Now, to highlight this issue around managers, um, I wanna show you 
one other graph and then we're going to get off of the uh, of the measuring. And this is a look in, in a company, specific company, sample company three, we're calling it. And you can see in this year that they measured 53% of their employees were engaged, 47% were disengaged. You can see the actual employee counts inside the, the bars. Now, now we're going to look at four work groups within the company. And I see this first work group at the top, work group one says manager one, they're 100% engaged. The 10 members of that team, all of them are engaged. Six are A players, four are B players. That's just outstanding. But then I look at another work group, this work group at the bottom, work group four, they're 100% disengaged. Now, this is the issue, and we see this in every organization we measure. There's a, there's a big variance in, in levels of engagement when you break it down to the work group, and that's the most important place to look. Same company, same pay scale, same culture. What's the only difference between these two work groups? The manager. Yeah. And this is why it's just so important to get this data. If you want to move the needle quickly, you have to start with managers. And for us, um, our average client improves engagement uh, by 23% in just the first year. It's just a remarkable shift when you use science and you use this approach that we talk about, just understanding the agenda of the brain and, and how to implement that. Um, so enough on the measuring. I'm going to pause here. I see uh, one thing in the chat room and then two questions. Let me go to that. Um, in order to implement this language within an organization, it seems like it requires a level of mastery and perhaps discovery on the part of managers. Outside of hiring your company, what do you recommend as a way to implement a practice to start playing with this neuroscience language and framework? What are the other resources out there to access this language and begin practicing? Really good question. There's not a lot out there. Uh, I did write a book. Um, and I, uh, hold on a second, I'll just show it to you so you can recognize the cover. Um, I was asked by um, uh, CEOs over the, over the years to, to go ahead and write a book. So I wrote a book, it's published by Forbes, and it's called Thrive by Design, the neuroscience that drives high performance cultures. And in the book, I try to use everyday language and walk managers through it. I will tell you though, the, the most common way this is done for us, and it's not necessarily hiring our company, but we do have a boot camp for managers, and, in, and now it's being done virtually, and we've got three of them that'll be coming up on the books in June. And in these four hours, we take managers into this science, explain it to them, get them to understand it, and then they create action plans of what they're gonna do based on it. But other than my book, I've got podcasts and blog posts, lots of resources online. Um, it's not as easy to do. I, I will have one other recommendation for you, we have put all of this on a website, not our company website, but we have another platform. We don't market it really, it's there for our survey clients, but it is accessible to others. And it's called managerresourcecenter.com. Um, and all of our materials are there and, and anyone can subscribe. To, it's a subscription website and it's all there. But I can tell you there just isn't much else out there in, in the literature. I'm sorry about that. Uh, two other questions. Um, oh, just, just an answer, just someone saying, great, uh, thanks. Okay, great. Um, so let me keep going. I want to I get uh, started talking about uh, some of the specific resources related to, to COVID-19 and the environment we're in, because that's the other part we promised uh, in this webinar. The role of fear and stress. So I want to I give you two slides now on fear and the impact of fear and, and what it's doing to folks. It's very important that when we talk about fear, many managers talk about the irrational fear that my employees have or people that are having about this. And they say the chances of getting it are small, 80%, there's, there's no symptoms, and I, and I get all of that. But even if you explain all that cognitively, the prefrontal cortex gets it, but I guarantee you, your limbic system is still feeling a very high sense of threat. And the limbic system is, is in charge. And I know we think, no, I'm rational. The risks are low. I can handle this. The world's leading researcher on the role of emotion, the brain says, the prefrontal cortex is the servant to the limbic system. So let's just dive into this a little bit. So understanding fear. Embedded in fear is overt threat. And that's why it has such a huge impact on people's behavior. Uh, 
The limbic system has, again, what's called control precedence in the brain. There's embedded uh, threat in, in fear, uh, and that's why it has such a big impact. The limbic system also is going to prepare for the worst. And, and doing that, the squirrel is always trying to prepare for the worst winter on, that, that the planet's ever experienced. Uh, and that perpetuates anxiety. And, and when that happens consistently or at a high level, it does encourage unhealthy coping strategies like hoarding toilet paper or 100 pound bags of rice um, or Lysol wipes that you couldn't possibly use in a lifetime. That, those are all examples of unhealthy coping. It is also contagious. It's easily and automatically shared with others. And there's already some work now about how easily it is being shared with children. And even if the parents are trying to protect them or they don't let them watch the, the nightly news, the shots of the emergency rooms, the children are picking it up in the behavior and the voice tone of the parents, the clip sentences, uh, the fact that they can't go out, they're not seeing their friends. Uh, so it's having an impact on kids as well. But this is an important one for managers. The feeling is real. That is, fear is real. And it's actually hardwired in us. It's, it's a natural part of the human condition to feel fear. Of the five basic fundamental human emotions, fear is assumed to be the first one we developed as a species because it's so related to our survival. Um, but the consequences we imagine in fear may not be real. This is the difference between what is possible and what is probable. Now, the limbic system wants to be prepared for everything that's possible, hence piles and stacks of toilet paper and wipes and Lysol and rice. Um, but is it probable that those things will never be available again? No, no, it's not. But we want managers to distinguish between fear is real, don't shame people for having it, uh, but the consequences they imagine may not be. One more slide on fear. <clears throat> Feelings are not facts. That doesn't diminish them. They're real, but they're not factual. So, but being in fear can increase what is called inaccurate meaning. We make the wrong meaning from things. Um, working from home in an isolated environment intensifies separation impact. As I mentioned before, the brain codes automatically separation, isolation as threat. We feel much more uncomfortable uh, when we're alone. We're capable, less capable of doing things when we feel isolated and alone. The good news here is that fear is containable. And the easiest way to contain fear is with human connection. Uh, not with someone telling you you don't need to be worried. Not with a cognitive statement or sentence. But load sharing with another, maybe sharing your fear and hearing them talk about theirs. But the, the simple act of load sharing with another is one of the easiest ways to dissipate fear. You can interrupt a panic attack with the introduction of a stranger into a room with someone. Uh, they don't even have to know the person. It's just another homo sapien. That's just, again, how we're designed. Now, a really important thing for you here in this last item, the fear-based memories last a long time. So the things that you do as a leader, the things you've done over the last four weeks and you're going to do over the next six to eight weeks, those actions you take, the demeanor you have, the things you say may be with your employees for the rest of their life. Because memories embedded in fear last the longest. So you say something nice to someone, it can dissipate and they can forget about it. You say something harsh or in this kind of fear-based environment, they may never forget it. So this is a good time for, for all of us to slow down, be careful, be thoughtful, um, and, and to be cognizant of our own, what would be called emotional dysregulation and things that we might do or say because of how we feel. But let's dig deeper into stress. I want, I want us to get an understanding of the, of the impact of stress on us physiologically. So here are some stressors in the current environment that we don't normally have. Plenty of stress in real life, but now we have these. Uh, COVID-19 is an invisible threat. What's the big deal with that? The very first data the brain takes in is what it sees. The very first data the brain processes is what it's, it sees coming in through the eyes. The brain has made this assumption that the easiest way to protect yourself is to be able to see danger so you can respond to it. But this danger can't be seen. So stress goes up. There's a change in my routine. I have to embrace a new norm. That's a stressor. The need to work in the middle of a pandemic. It's just, it's just harder. I, I want to cope with my family, with things, with the stress, ambient stress I feel. Now I also have to work an eight-hour day like I did before. Stressor. 
potential job loss for myself or for people I know. How about this issue of personal capacity? Can I handle this? I don't know if I can do this anymore. You've probably seen the news clips from some of, of the emergency workers, the first responders, just saying, I don't know, I, I don't think I can do this. I, I, I'm just not capable of it. Stressor. Again, isolation or separation automatically codes the stress. Fear of harm to me or to my loved ones, my children. Uh, we, we have uh, first responders that are living in a garage or a trailer at their home uh, because they don't want to potentially uh, impact their family. Uh, parenting and partnering is harder. Uh, I will tell you, sadly, that spousal abuse is up since COVID-19, and so is child abuse have gone up. Um, it's just harder when we're with each other. For, for many uh, families, it's just harder to be together 24-7, especially if you're in a small space. It hasn't gone well for many, many families. And then just tolerating stress and disorientation is a stressor. Now, what is this doing to us physiologically? <clears throat> well, it compromises our immune system. And this is a nice irony. Because of all these stressors, I'm actually less capable of responding effectively with my immune system potential to potential bacteriological or, or viral threats. Um, I have less mental capacity. I literally, I, I don't have the same bench strength intellectually to get things done. I'm tired much more quickly. Uh, the fourth item down is feeling depleted and exhausted, and that's why. Now, faults and fears elevated and expanded. This is important for leaders to understand just for our own self-awareness. But the worst, this is another way of stating this, the worst in us emerges closer to the surface when we're stressed than when we're not. So as an example, if, if someone had uh, anger management issues, but they've learned how to control that, and whether, whether it's breathing or counting to 10 or whatever it is they do, it, most people just don't know they have that condition. Now, with these stressors, that anger is gonna be much closer to the surface, much more likely to be evidenced by others. Uh, we need to watch this. We, we might see some of our staff act out or do things or say things they've never said before. You just need to lean into that with a lot of grace. Uh, we have difficulty focusing, we feel preoccupied, and when we're this stressed, our threat vigilance increases. It was high before, but now it gets even higher. So what can we do to mitigate some of these stressors? So uh, safe and secure connections is the most effective way to mitigate stress. That is feeling connected to important others. Now that might be at home with family. It could be a spouse, it could be parents, it could be children, uh, but for people that work regularly and have healthy relationships with their team members and their manager or supervisor, that is a huge source of stress mitigation. Just having some consistency in our life right now around tasks or meetings. So if you had normally had Monday morning meetings, still have Monday morning meetings, just use Zoom to do them, but bring back some normalcy, some consistency. Um, predictability and clarity is gonna help a lot. Strong leadership and direction from you and others in the company. You may not know where we're gonna be in, in a year, but do you know where, do you know what our direction is for the next four weeks, for the next 12 weeks, for the next 12 months? Can you, what, what can you share with them? Uh, that, that will help give them some hope and reassurance here in the bottom left. Uh, we're on this, we're gonna get through this. Encouragement um, is similar to hope and reassurance, but this is encouragement for them. Yes, you can do it. Yes, we can do it. We faced threats before, we got through the recession. We can do this, it's gonna be all right. And then connection technology, and that would be things like Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, Microsoft Teams, uh, Google Hangouts, but whenever you can use uh, technology to connect people, and I mean the visual part, um, a Zoom call is much more effective than a phone call. A phone call is much more effective than a broadcast email. Um, so we want people seeing each other. So when you're doing these Zoom calls with your staff, it would be great if you could uh, encourage them to have cameras on. Uh, maybe not mandated because some of them may feel that's too invasive or they may feel embarrassed about their surroundings but certainly cameras on is going to be um, a big, big help. Um, and so that's gonna be uh, very, very important. Now, I'm gonna pause here on what else leaders can do and just take a quick look at the questions. <clears throat> have an employee who lives alone, has limited family contact, and having difficulty with, uh, uh, some, with so much alone time working from home, have tried to check in often and keep engaged, but looking for other ideas. Well, it, this is just, this is the rugged thing. And, and this has been a part of remote workers and challenges of rem remote workers in the past. What we've traditionally said about people that you know have to work remotely 
is you can identify people who can do that well if you test for those conditions. That is, you can use psychoanalytic testing to find people who will work at a high level in isolation. They're just more, uh, they're just better wired for it. Uh, but for someone who isn't, this is tough. Um, and, and the, you know, yes, you've reached out and tried to do it. Can you have other team members reach out? Can you create a, a project, even a micro project that this person is in charge of or a part of that involves two or three others where they need to be in regular daily contact? Try to find um, some way to get this person engaged in dialogue with others, preferably online uh, if possible. Get them to uh, identify webinars they could uh, uh, check out. Um, just wh whatever you can do to get them involved uh, is, is going to be helpful. But generally, other members of the get them involved in projects, uh, give them some things to watch and pay attention to, uh, again, webinars or other products. Um, you know, on our uh, managerresourcecenter.com website, we've got videos and, and articles and self-assessments. You've just got to get them moving and understanding them. The other thing you can do is going to be in the very next slides uh, that I show you around validation, um, uh, understanding, and empathy. So I, I know you've been in touch with them, but I'm going to show you how to be in touch with them and get into deeper tissue. Um, okay, so... Let's keep moving. Thank you for that question. I appreciate it. So, <clears throat> so what are some other things you can do related even to that question? Well, we need to break the isolation, um, but not just, just a call, but in the call, demonstrate a lot of curiosity, caring, connection, connect with them at a deeper level. What's a way to connect with them at a deeper level? That's this acronym at the bottom, VUE, V-U-E. And it, it stands for Validation, Understanding, and Empathy. The, the validate is something that almost any manager can do almost reflexively. And that's just to acknowledge the experience that someone is having in the moment. Uh, I see you. I know this is hard. Understanding is a little different. I'm not just noticing what's going on for them and validating it. I'm actually in it with them. I'm going to join with them in the experience. And the empathize, the empathy, that's helping them feel felt. Not just seen, validated, not just understood, but empathized with. And that is a felt experience. So let's dig deeper into this and show you how to do it. And you can come back and use these slides uh, to dig, dig deeper after the fact. Validation, just connect with them, see them where they are. Uh, you might say something like, I know what we're going through is rugged and this situation has an impact on you. I know this situation isn't ideal. So that's just seeing them. And this is good, but it's not deep tissue. And it, and it doesn't necessarily uh, leave them feeling felt and connected. So I, I want managers to go to the next level. This is slightly deeper tissue. Um, I, I want them to say, I, I understand you. I hear you. I get that it can be hard to focus on. What do you need? It, it, it does feel harder. It, it, number of challenges. Finding the balance feels elusive. This is them just understanding, not just noticing, but coming alongside it as well. Uh, and that gets into deeper tissue, which is better. The, the optimal place, the deepest tissue, comes with the role of empathy. And the difference between understanding and empathy, uh, so I'm going to come back here to, uh, to the, under, uh, the understand. You see this last uh, scripted uh, question that could be asked at the bottom, what do you need? And that's about understanding, but it's still fairly cognitive. The question for empathy is not what do you need, it's how are you? How are you? How's your, how's your partner doing? And, and name the, 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 the name of the spouse. How are you and your family coping with all that's going on? Uh, it's hard to see our children struggling with the isolation and anxiety. Whenever you talk about someone's family and children, you're much more likely to be getting into deeper tissue. But this just isn't um, uh, uh, understanding the situation they're in. This is being in the situation with them and feeling it and, and sharing some of that felt experience. And even a little vulnerability, that last statement at the bottom of the page, I feel anxious as well. Yeah, me too. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling it too. Um, <clears throat> really, really important to get to these, these deeper layers. Um, the value of building relationships uh, allows for load sharing, trust and respect, accountability and collaboration, and resilience. Um, I will tell you that some, uh, some of our clients, uh, this goes back to the question about what else can I do. Some of our clients are using some of the tools that can be embedded in Zoom, and they're, they're having uh, a game after. They're, they're, having, they're doing gaming together. And I think it's called Jackbox. 
Um, but there are some uh, things that you can embed with Zoom that allow you just to do fun things. Many of our clients are also having a, a virtual happy hour where they're you know, closing work down at three o'clock, but everybody's on Zoom and they're just chatting like it's a cocktail party. You can put people, Zoom will let you to put people in breakout groups so they can talk about things. Just get people talking. All, and the, one of the most valuable things about this is when we have these safe and secure relationships, we're more resilient. We can endure challenges more effectively. Um, <clears throat> some tips on building relationships. Notice facial expressions, especially the upper part of the face. Uh, connect with people personally. So you've done the Zoom call with the team. Uh, maybe you notice that one person on the team looked like they had a very worried, uh, very worried expression, a furrowed brow. Call them back individually. How are you doing? Uh, ask for feedback. Be open and vulnerable yourself. It's a shame in Western culture that vulnerability has been pejoratized to mean the same thing as, as weakness, but it isn't. Uh, expressing some vulnerability is a, is a very important strength for leaders that can be used strategically. You're not vulnerable to the point of being immobilized. You're vulnerable just enough so that people lean in and want to help. Now, create a felt sense of safety in any way you can. That's about being predictable and consistent, providing clarity, supporting collaboration. Come back to our core values, uh, meaning and purpose and, and mission and vision. Those things haven't changed in, in COVID-19. It's a great sort of bedrock place. Our, our values haven't changed. The way we're gonna live them or do them, that, that has, but let them know there's something that, that hasn't changed. They can still count on it and just build trust and connections. Now, what else can you do? I wanna give you a simple conversational template and you may have to uh, come back to look at this and spend a little bit more time in it with the recording. First thing you're gonna do is you're gonna ask a question. That is, you're gonna evoke something relational with curiosity and simple question, how are you doing with all of this? Now, almost anybody can ask a question. They can do that first thing, but not everybody can do the second. And that's to listen well. Uh, so to be present in the moment, nod, use direct eye contact, keep your mouth closed, pay attention to their facial expressions. Don't talk, just listen. And so, but a bunch of people can do that second one listening. The third thing is, is what gets you into the deep tissue. The third thing is what makes a conversation where the person will truly, for example, feel felt. And in this stage, you evoke again. You reflect on something you heard and you're curious about it. And then you just gently probe. You said this is really hard on your children. What does that look like? So you're just coming in and, and a gentle probe about something you heard. That's the level that lets them know, okay, this is different than a cursory check-in. This person really cares about me. That's really valuable support to give to your managers. Can they do this? And just let them remember that we're not trying to solve their challenges. You're just trying to engage your staff as you come alongside. I want you to visualize coming alongside people emotionally. Uh, you can't come alongside them, obviously, physically at this point but I can come alongside them uh, from the standpoint of a safe and secure connection to understand and empathize with them. There are some also some tactical things you can do. Um, uh, help them out with working at home, either, you know, even if it's just a simple list of best practices on how to do it, that information is out there. Can you compile it and give it to your employees? What about helping them with a better data plan, a printer, earbuds, monitor, notebooks, pens, and some kind of a home allowance? Uh, maybe some work needs to be reallocated because you know they're a single parent and they have kids that are at home now and need to be educated. Maybe we'll, we'll do some reallocation uh, in the short term. One of our clients, a trade association, did this. They asked their employees, what do you need? They were a little afraid about what they were going to get, but it turns out all of their employees, when they asked them, what do you need, the bill came to under $1,000. It was as low as a $7 mouse. The most expensive thing, ironically, was an Ikea desk for 169 can you reach out to your people that are remote and, and help them? Um, even your people that are coming into work, there's some things you can do for them there. Can you provide the sanitizer? Can you get masks? What are you doing to keep the workplace safe? Um, so what, what, what are some of these things that employees uh, want and need? Um, so let me show you in, in this, the few minutes, uh, oh, and then time allocation. Uh, ask your managers to take the time they used to spend um, just commuting to and from work and ask them to dedicate that specific time to staying in touch with their team. Okay, so let me go into some of the resources uh, that I, I want you to know are available to you. 
So we do have our manager resource center um, that has these resources I've talked about. And here we provide both resources for managers, videos, articles, other tools, templates. We send them regular reminders on things that they could be using and should be using. That's key to habit change because that's what we want to do with them. Uh, but then we also provide support for them. If they have a tough issue with an employee, they simply type it up in an email on MRC. Uh, the acronym we use is MRC. They email it to us and with 48 hours, we get them a custom response. These three things on this platform are what we have found is the, is the right mix, the right combination. Not just stuff, but really good science-based stuff and then reminders on it's there and how to use it and what to use. So for example, um, the emails that managers are getting, we send them one email a week, but the emails over the last several weeks, as you might imagine, are directing them to specific resources, either about COVID-19, stress, remote workers, making sure they have the right tools at the right time. Um, and we are getting more uh, support questions from them as well. Um, but, and this is just what their dashboard looks like when, when they go on to, to see everything. I've pulled four resources from um, our manager resource center and made them available at this site that you can go to and get them for free. Just go to webinar.e3solutions.com um, and you will see these sources, uh, how to work with remote teams, how to manage stress and anxiety, and some empathy statements to use at work and at home, um, and a reflection tool on navigating amidst uncertainty, which is where most people feel they are uh, right now. Um, I've gone slightly past my time. I want to show you a couple other resources. This exercise, KISS, Keep, Improve, Stop, Start. When you start bringing people back, before you start bringing people back, we recommend this exercise. Ask them, what have we done in the past that we should keep doing at work, no matter what the environment is outside? What do we need to improve on at work? That might be cleaning or, or partitions. What should we stop doing? Uh, big meetings in small rooms might be one of them. What should we start doing? Uh, maybe staggering employees. I'll tell you, some of our, our big clients, uh, they're, they're, as, as soon as their cities open, they're going to a half on, half off. That is half the staff come in for two weeks, then they go home for two weeks and work from home, the others come in. That way, if there is any, anybody gets sick or catches the virus, it's restricted to just half and they can do contact connecting and, and make sure everything's okay. This is something that we just uh, released um, a week ago, and this is what we call the E3-1. This is an employee engagement survey. It is all 28 of our questions that is asked in a fully automated survey. And, and we've priced this at just $495. Uh, there's some very, very small clients that said, I can't afford to measure engagement. It's, it's just been too expensive. So we, we brought it down to a very manageable cost. And here, um, you'll, all of this launches automatically. You get very sophisticated reporting. Um, how engaged is your team? Uh, what are the big strengths of your culture? What are your top opportunities? Um, there's a lot more reporting than this, but if, if you're interested in literally a $495 tool, this all of our questions that we use in our typical tool, it's much more expensive, but this is a one work group. Think of it as a pulse survey. How, are, how is my team doing right now? Um, it's an easy way for you to get that data. Um, if you are interested in, in, in this discussion and the science, uh, if you listen to podcasts, you can go to wherever you get your podcast search for Thrive by Design. The podcast, uh, you can find those podcasts also by going to donream.com, which is the website that Forbes Books put together when they uh, published the book. Um, here's another copy of the book. You can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love that. Um, uh, that's my email address, my real email address, not a phony one. Um, you can go to donream.com there at the top. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, you can get additional free resources at e3solutions.com, but I would recommend you first go to the webinar.e3solutions.com uh, site. There are a couple other um, questions we would ask for you here on um, Mentimeter just to uh, rate this webinar before you turned your phones off. Uh, anything else that you'd like to see in the webinar is there. Um, if you want credit for this, um, for in the tree care industry, for the Certified Tree Care Safety Professional, the CTSP, um, just go to this location, email, them, I'm sorry, email uh, the code TCIA20-20 uh, to ctsp at tcia.org. 
the webinar name um, and, and you will get credit for this. I'll leave that up there for a little bit longer. Um, I do see what looks like one uh, additional question. I will go to that right now and then we will close out. Um, nope, uh, no additional questions, my bad. Look, I hope this was helpful. Um, it will be recorded and available to you. Um, be more intentional with your culture. Uh, don't be afraid to find out how engaged your employees are right now. If you want to find out uh, how many employees you have in each of those four categories on the bell curve, consider our E31 tool, which we designed to be easy and inexpensive. Um, and then just reach out to us if there's anything else we can do to be helpful. So thank you very much. I appreciate your participation. Um, if there are any other uh, questions, uh, just uh, I will stay on here for another five minutes or so. I'm not just going to peel away, but if you want to go to the chat function or uh, ask a question, I will be here to answer that question. So thank you all very much. Hope you're safe and surviving well, and I uh, hope to see you at another TCIA event in the future.